So antimicrobial proteins are going to enhance the innate defenses by doing two things, attacking microorganisms directly or by hindering the microorganisms' ability to reproduce. The most important antimicrobial pro proteins uh, include interferons and complement proteins. When a cell is infected by a virus, the virus enters the cell and produces structures that are not found in uninfected cells. The presence of this viral material signals the cell to produce interferon. The interferon moves out of the cell and attaches to receptors on nearby cells of the same type. The cell that produces the interferon is unable to save itself. The virus replicates in this cell and then moves out to infect nearby cells. The nearby cell that already has interferon bound to its surface responds in several ways, including production of enzymes that degrade messenger RNA and prevent protein synthesis. Thus, a virus can attach and enter the cell, but completion of the viral replication cycle is prevented. Interferons uh, generally are a family of immune modulating proteins. Cells that are going to be infected by viruses would produce these interferons, and these interferons help warn uh, those neighboring uh, healthy cells. And so the interferons then are going to be released and enter the neighboring cells or stimulate the neighboring cells uh, to produce proteins that are going to block viral reproduction and also degrade viral RNA. Uh, that's the way, there's, there's two kinds, there's the alpha interferons and beta interferons, and those work uh, in this way. Uh, the alpha and beta interferons also activate uh, natural killer cells as well. There's also gamma interferons, or they're also called immune interferon, and these are secreted by lymphocytes, and this has widespread immune mobilizing effects. Uh, and it also activates uh, macrophages. Uh, interferons also activate natural killer cells and macrophages. Uh, so in this way, they can indirectly fight, uh, help fight off cancer. Um, and uh, in, um, in medicine, they've uh, produced artificial interferons that are used to treat disorders such as hepatitis C, uh, genital warts, and uh, multiple sclerosis. This diagram uh, allows us to visualize the production of interferons. So on the left, you have a host cell uh, right here that has uh, been infected. A virus enters there and the virus begins to be replicated, but this also causes a switch uh, or a gene to be turned on that produces interferons. So your interferon gene then gets transcribed uh, which will produce the mRNA for interferon, then interferon uh, is likely produced in, um, in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And so then this uh, secretory vesicle is produced uh, with the product interferon. Interferon is released and then goes and to neighboring cells and activates those neighboring cells to switch on antiviral mRNA genes. Uh, so they're transcribed to produce our mRNA and then those genes are uh, translated and producing proteins that are going to help block viral reproduction. Uh, and in this way, we can slow the uh, production of new virals, uh, viral particles. And then there is the complement system. So uh, we had interferons, now we have the complement system. And the complement system consists of 20 or more blood proteins that circulate in the blood in inactive form. And they include C1 through C9, as well as factors B, D, and P, as well as regulatory proteins. And what complement does is provides a major mechanism for destroying uh, foreign substances. The activation enhances as well uh, inflammation and also directly destroys bacteria. Uh, so those uh, are some important functions there of this. There's actually three pathways uh, that have uh, been shown to help activate the uh, complement system. There is the classic pathway because it's called classic because this is the first one uh, that was understood or discovered. And then there is 
the alternate pathway down here, which was the second one to be discovered, and more recently, is the lectin pathway. Complement consists of a group of serum proteins that activates inflammation, destroys cells, and participates in opsonization. Complement can be activated by a number of different foreign molecules. The complement proteins respond in a sequential manner, producing a cascade of reactions. The major components are C1 through C9, named in the order that they were discovered, not in the order in which they function. The complement cascade can be activated by the classical pathway or by the alternative pathway. In the classical pathway, C1 becomes activated when it binds to an antigen antibody complex. The activated C1 then cleaves C2 into C2A and C2B and C4 into C4A and C4B. C2B and C4B combine to form a protease called C3 convertase. C3 convertase then cleaves C3 into C3A and C3B. In the alternative pathway, antigens such as endotoxin, polysaccharides, or cell wall components react with C3B. Small amounts of C3A and C3B are constantly being formed from C3, but without activation, they are soon destroyed. C3B reacts with the proteins factor B, factor D, and properidin to form a complex called C3 convertase, which cleaves C3 into C3A and C3B. Both of these pathways of complement activation follow the same sequence after cleavage of C3. C3A is involved in stimulating inflammation. C3B reacts with other complement components to form C3 convertase, which forms more C3A and C3B. C3B also attaches to the surfaces of microorganisms. Phagocytes have a binding site for C3B. Therefore, microorganisms with C3B bound to their surfaces are more susceptible to phagocytosis. Coating of bacteria to make them more susceptible to phagocytosis is called opsonization. Addition of properidin to C3 convertase results in formation of C5 convertase, which cleaves C5 into C5A and C5B. C5A enhances inflammation and acts as a chemoattractant for phagocytes. C5B reacts with other complement components including C6, C7, C8, and C9 to form a membrane attack complex. This structure forms a hole in the cell membrane and causes cells to lyse. So let's go back real quick here to the classical pathway. This one involves antibodies. And antibodies are present and circulating around, recognize and bind to an invading organism uh, like a bacterium, and then bind, uh, as, after the antibodies bind to that uh, microorganism, then the antibodies will bind to the complement components, which activates them. Okay, so uh, this is called complement fixation. Uh, when we are, uh, the antibodies bind uh, and activate the complement components. Once the initial complement proteins are activated, then we're going to get a cascade or a series of reactions, one reaction causing uh, the next reaction to occur in this system. For lectin pathway, which was a more recent discovery, uh, lectins are produced uh, by the innate system and these lectins recognize foreign invaders. The lectin then uh, can bind to specific sugars on the foreign invader, whether it's bacteria or uh, any other invading pathogen. And once they bind, then they uh, help activate complement as well. And then there's the alternate pathway. And here, the complement cascade is activated spontaneously in the alternate pathway. And here is this happens when certain complement uh, factors bind directly to the foreign invader. And because the microorganism on its surface lacks inhibitors, uh, this allows the cascade to proceed. So uh, each pathway is going to involve an activation of proteins in an orderly sequence or a cascade, uh, and each one catalyzes the next. Each pathway is going to converge on 
a C3 factor. Uh, and uh, so all three of those, the, uh, these pathways, uh, the classic, the lectin, and the alternate. Uh, and what this is going to do is when we get to this point here, then the C3 is going to be split or cleaved into two parts, the C3A and the C3B component. Uh, the splitting uh, initiates common terminal pathway that enhances inflammation. It's going to promote phagocytosis by optimization and also cause cell lysis for uh, the invading uh, pathogen. Cell lysis itself is going to begin when C3B uh, binds, when the C3B binds to the target cell and that's gonna trigger the insertion of complement proteins called the membrane attack complex, or MAC, uh, into the cell's membrane. Uh, so this membrane attack complex is gonna produce a pore or a hole. Uh, it's gonna stabilize a hole within the membrane of the microbe, and that's gonna cause an influx of water, which uh, results in the lysis of the microbe. So the, the microbe bursts open. Uh, because of this process. The C3B also uh, causes optimization, so the C3B tags it for a recognition, easier recognition by phagocytes to come in and uh, consume uh, the invading bacteria. The C3A, the other component, uh, is going to help amplify inflammation. And it does this by stimulating mast cells and basophils which are going to release histamine. So histamine is one of those uh, vasodilators that increases uh, the, the uh, permeability of, of, your, of your blood vessels there. Uh, we're also going to be attracting neutrophils and other inflammatory cells to the area. So this diagram shows all three pathways at the top and it shows them converging right in this area here and uh, there they all converge right here at the C3 and the C3 gets cleaved so we get our C3B and our C3A so the C3B is is going to go here and call, create opsonization the C3B also is involved in producing the membrane attack complex here uh, so remember opsonization is going to be where we tag the pathogens with the C3B for recognition by phagocytes over here, the C3B, along with these other uh, complement uh, factors, uh, including C5B, C6, C7, C8, and C9, are going to produce this pore right here. And that pore is going to allow substances to rapidly enter the bacterium and cause it to lice. Uh, over here, the inflammation part here, uh, there is that C3A and the C3A, along with a component of C5, C5A, are going to go and they're going to stimulate the release of histamines. Uh, so that promotes inflammation. Finally, we're going to end with our uh, the idea of a fever. What is a fever? Fever is an abnormally high body temperature that is a systemic response to invading microorganisms uh, and in this case here, when a leukocyte or a macrophage is exposed to a foreign substance, they're going to release substances called pyrogens. And I think if we were to look at what the, the part pyro means, uh, that refers to fire, which fires are hot, right? So um, that's going to, those pyrogens are going to go stimulate an increase in your body temperature. Those pyrogens travel up to your hypothalamus, where you have your thermal regulatory centers, your thermostat and that's going to help raise your body temperature. There are benefits to fevers, as uncomfortable as they might uh, feel or seem. Uh, one of the things the fever does is causes your organs, the liver and the spleen, to hold on to or sequester iron and zinc, which must be important in microbial metabolism, so this can help slow the growth of my, uh, my microbes. And the other is to increase the metabolic rate of your, of your cells, in cases where there is damaged tissues where bacteria might have entered and this can help increase the rate of uh, repair in the area.